place is Switzerland. The time, early spring, 1978. An unusual team of people makes its way to a secret rendezvous. Their goal, a tiny mountain village named Schmidruti. Head of the team is Lee Elders. Based in Phoenix, Arizona, he runs a company called Intercept that deals in industrial counter-espionage. Britt Elders, his wife and partner in Intercept, specializes in electronics. The third member of the team, also a partner and longtime associate, is Tom Welsh. They were brought here by Wendell Stevens, retired Air Force Colonel and for over 20 years one of the world's leading UFO investigators. Their mission? To check out one of the most remarkable UFO cases ever reported. One that has been called alternately too good to be true, the hoax of the century, or the start of a new age for humankind. Steve, how long has this case been going on? Since 1975. How many uh, sightings or experiences has this man had? Well, he's had over 30 that I've heard of so far. What makes the case so special in your mind? Why bring uh, us all the way up here from Arizona? Man, up to now we've been dealing with just the tip of the iceberg. There's a, a mountain of evidence here. There's other witnesses, there's lots of photographs, there's recorded sounds, there's landing tracks, a lot of things in this case. Bigger than any case I ever saw before. How far are we from Zurich? Oh, about 35 miles, 35 kilometers, I think. Man, I've never seen so many switchbacks in my life. This is remote. Stevens leads them over a circuitous route, winding through back roads and stopping often along the way. Why all the precautions? Well, I didn't want to tell you this before, but this man's been shot at. Shot at? Shot at. Yeah, somebody's trying to kill him. Why? I don't know. There's uh, some people are spooked by this whole thing, and he's being threatened. That's My terrible. Lord. Thus begins what was to become a five-year investigation. Before it is over, they will be embroiled in controversy and forced to use every resource at their command. Hi, Mr. Hi, Hi, Billy. Nice to see you. Okay. Yeah. I brought my. The friend's been telling you about. This is Britt Elders. Hi. Hi. Good to meet you. Lee Elders. His name is Edward Meyer. He is called Billy, an old nickname that sprang from his fondness for heroes of the American West. Buffalo Bill, Wild Bill, and Billy the Kid. He is a farmer. He claims he has been in contact with beings from another world. He also claims to have proof of these contacts. Mr. Meyer, when did the experiences begin? The contact begins on January 28, 1975, in Hinville. Mm -hmm. How did it happen? What, what made you go outside into the forest? I got something like a very nice voice in my head. I heard something to leave the house, to go out and to take a photo camera with me. So I left my house, and then when I was far upside from the village, I heard a singing noise in the sky. And when I was looking up there, I have seen a disc. This disc was flying on the clouds, and then it came to the point where I was uh, staying with my motorcycle. Then slowly, slowly, it came lower and lower and set it down between the white trees and the forest there behind. Mm -hmm. Meyer later photographs the impressions left by the disc's tripod landing gear. The grass has been pressed and swirled in a counterclockwise direction. Even a year later, the grass has not sprung back, but Meyer notes that the impressions swarm with insect life. Then I have seen a person who came out of the disc. A person and, came out? Yeah. And when the person came out of the left side of the tree stair, I have seen that it is a woman. Mr. Meyer, what did they look like? She looks like a human from this earth, like you like I, like human beings from this earth. 
You call us extraterrestrials, and you attribute to us superhuman powers. But we are like you. We too are still far removed from perfection and must evolve constantly, just like yourselves. After the first words, we turned and was going to this tree here. You walked over here? Yeah. How tall was she, Billy? Uh, about uh, one meter and seventy centimeter. About like that? So a little bit about like my size. Ah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then she sits chest here and I here. Sit down. Ah. <clears throat> then you then sat here, here and talked to her? Yeah, then we was talking here for uh, about one hour or one hour and a quarter, something like that. Did she give you a name? What did you call her? Yeah, she told me her name is Semyase. Semyase? Yeah. Billy, what kind of feeling did you have sitting here under this tree with a woman who just landed in a spacecraft? I wasn't afraid about these things. I was afraid about the army only because they have a station somewhere there behind the forest. But I wasn't afraid about the disc. Where do they come from, Mr. Meyer? They shall be coming from the star picture of the Pleiades. The Pleiades, a bright star cluster some 500 light years from Earth. Although the cluster consists of hundreds of stars, seven stand out clearly to the naked eye. The Greeks call them the nymphs of heaven. We call them the seven sisters. What was going through your mind? Uh, what did you want to talk about? You see, my head was full of questions. But the most of the time, she was telling me and I hadn't many chances to ask her something. Several times we have tried to establish contact with Earth humans, but usually those selected were not willing. They were afraid others would consider them liars, or mad, or would try to destroy them. You see, the first she told me I shall get the most best pictures of UFOs, what's ever happened on Earth. And the second thing, I shall go out to tell the truth to the human on Earth, why they are coming to here, what reason they have that they are coming to Earth not to harm us, not to make war, not to bring peace, just to bring a teaching. Why are they interested in us, a society thousands of years behind them in technological development? According to Maya, we share common ancestors. Their forefathers were our forefathers. We are, in a sense... This is the place, Berger Umlikum, where I took that picture. Show us how you took the picture, Billy. Oh. Maya takes the team to other contact sites and it demonstrates how he operates his cameras. I have here a small wheel to turn the film and I can get the picture. Where was the ship exactly when you took it that day? Uh, you see there is standing Wendell. Yes. Uh -huh. It was about that place. <clears throat> Hovering above Wendell to some degree, right? Yeah. Uh-huh. You see, on this way I put on my camera. Yep. We're taking yep. movies, right? Yeah. With a film camera on a tripod, Maya can shoot stills with his 35mm camera at the same time. And then I can start to film. Here I got the movie. When was the ship hanging there up? And when it after was jumping by side. Jumped? Yes, jumped. It jumped away nearly so fast and the speed of light. By jumping, Maya means the ship disappears and reappears. Each time I got an uh, electrical hit when the ship was jumping. And uh, at later time they told me there shall be a very strong power field 
mm -hmm. uh, electric power field, and from that out, I always got the electrical hit. By electrical hit, Maya means an electric shock. He also noted a light shift at each event. Billy, how many sightings have you had here? On this place, I had uh, one... Maya sighting. takes the investigators to over a dozen sites, describing the craft, which he calls us beam ships, and relating the information uh, he says the Pleiadians gave him. Yeah. Are there any other groups coming here, Billy? Uh, how they told me there are yeah. each year about uh, 22, 23 different civilization. They comes to here to work here, study here, visit here. Mm -hmm. And the uh, other thing, there are, together with the play audience, working here on Earth, about uh, eight other groups. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. they not belong directly to the Pleiadian civilization. But they, they work together with the Pleiadians. They work together with the Pleiadians. So there's an association of some kind between the Pleiadians and some others that are also... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, how long have they been... They've been coming uh, here for the past 13,500 years, about. 13,000? Yeah. And here we are on the place now where I got the movie picture. Mm -hmm. You see here, the, uh, you see there the road, and on the middle of the distance to the road was the ship hanging in the air and bubbling in a very strong wind. And in the background on the road was driving cars from Tailingen to Rumlikon and from Rumlikon to Tailingen. But if somebody has seen something about the ship out of the cars, I don't know. I you didn't, didn't hear anything after that? No, 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 no. no. But there are other witnesses to some of the sightings. Ernst Keller-Müller lives down the mountain from the Meyer farm. And what did you see from here, sir? What did you see? I saw two on his sight, where he saw the lights and then they disappeared and then they uh, came on again. That's why he noticed it. And then what happened? What is going to happen? Then it had that was open light, it had that light up, a stuck light. The one that uh, had the light going below also went down. Went down to the ground? Not all the way to the ground, but the other ones stayed in the same place and this one went further down. Is, isn't that the direction of Schmidt Ruti over there? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes, that's the direction of Schmidt Ruti. Have you ever heard of anything going on over there in the Schmidruti area? A couple of days later, he called Schmidruti to find out. Did you know Mr. Meyer at that time? And then behind the forest, it was a little light. Bernadette Brandt, a computer programmer. So? Uh -huh. And it jumps like a ball. Like it bounced? Like a ball. Uh -huh. It goes up and down and up and down Did when it, it goes bigger? when it goes up no the same greatness when it goes up it was white and when it goes down it was red the nearest thing to a government official in the area is the postman in the village of Schmidruti. have you seen any of the photographs yourself only two or three do you believe them yeah. He says he, he can't imagine how you can take a picture like this. He is the kind of a guy who only believes what he sees himself. Jakob Birchinger works the farm with Maya. Okay, he saw the light ball going away from here, from him, if it's in that uh, 45 degree angle. 45 degree angle? Well, that's right. Chief? And he, he can't tell how far it was, it was very difficult to, to say. But then it stood still, that ball of light, and changed direction, came directly towards him with an unbelievable speed. My name is Elsie Moser. I'm living in Niederglatt. I am a school teacher. The first time when I saw it, it was up here. With, I saw it with uh, about seven other people. Were you frightened? No, not at all. I was thinking, oh, well, okay, now I have seen one. <laughs> Guido Moosbrugger is not a neighbor. He lives about two hours away in Austria. He heard about the Maya experiences and came to see for himself. 
Have you ever had any experience with Billy in connection with these things that are going on here? Yes, I have seen a few demonstrations myself, especially at night, and was present at the landing site doing one landing, and I saw other things. A lot of things happened in those six years. You have seen things with your own eyes. Did you ever photograph anything? I was allowed two times to photograph at night. As we sat inside the car, we saw all of a sudden to the north, above the meadow, out of nowhere, a fire red disc, about as large as a headlight. And then what happened? And then it, was and then it suddenly disappeared. Then there was a short pause, after which, at the same place again, appeared all of a sudden a silvery white ball. Then there was another pause. And then the same ball appeared again. It flew toward us, got larger and larger, then shrunk, collapsed, and then, like magic, it was gone. And best of all, it looked like a shower of sparks. In all, over 30 other witnesses corroborate Maya's testimony. The contacts continue at a furious pace, sometimes two or three a week. Maya claims to have had over 130 meetings. He has taken hundreds of photographs and has over 3,000 pages of notes. For a long time, we've had an urge to contact someone who sincerely wants to be helpful in our mission. Here and there, we open such contacts with inhabitants of different worlds, but only when they have developed enough to become rational, thinking beings. Then we prepare them for the thought that they are not the only rational, thinking beings in the universe. Brit questions Calliope, Maya's wife, whose nickname is Poppy. Poppy, how long have you and Billy been married? Uh, now, 60 years. And you were married in Greece? Yes. Uh-huh. What did you think when Billy first told you about these experiences? Her English shaky, Poppy reverts to German. No. It was difficult to, uh, at the beginning. Mm -hmm. While, uh, <coughs> because she never knows anything about this case. Well, she didn't know? No. When did she find out? Because she says Billy takes a long time that her tell her something from the UFO. And then how did you feel about it? And she was thinking why this happened all to me. Billy shows her every time the picture that he takes and so she was knowing about from the picture from the UFO. But she was very critical about this case and asking some questions about all this case. And it was very difficult for Bobby. Were there times when you had just had it up to here? And you could... She never was thinking to leaving this whole case, but she was uh, crying and fighting against Billy and against the whole case. At one point, Poppy admits, she was so fed up, she burned half the photographs. Today the feeling is other because she knows very well about the whole case and things about the Pleiadians and this is very important for her. Listen here. Wow, you recorded that here? My wife recorded this one here, and in the meantime, I've been there down very standingly with the older recorder. You had another recorder down yes. there? How high was the ship above you? Uh, about 60 meters. 60 meters. How far would you estimate it is from here oh, down there today? I think some 300 meters. The sounds bear no resemblance to anything Stevens has heard before. Maya gives him both tapes for analysis. Overwhelmed by the evidence they have gathered, the team meets to plan the next stage of the investigation. We're getting it all. We'll leave tonight? Yeah. Okay, on Meyer. I think Meyer is a very sincere and honest type person. What do you think, Steve? Has anything changed since you were here? 
The man seems to be the same, but uh, there's some things changing around him. He's, he's, got, he's better off. He's got more people around him. More things are happening, but he still is basically sincere. What about the psychological aspects to the man? Do you think it's possible that he's a little schizoid? I mean, it's difficult to tell what, if, it, if what he's saying the Pleiadians are telling him is actually coming from them or coming from him. How do you determine that? Well, we can never prove Too many that other people involved. aspect of the case. Others have seen the same thing. There's a, a terrific cross-section of people here. You've got a school teacher, you've got a commercial pilot, you've got a businessman, you've got a CPA. They're as good as any average cross-section of society we've got. And they all tested him themselves to their own satisfaction before they ever got this far. Well, I think we ought to go back and throw the book at this one everything we can, top technology we can get involved. I think we ought to let the chips fall where we may and just see what we find. We're going to run down and say goodbye to Meyer and we'll tell him goodbye uh, for you. Give him my best. Okay. okay. Of I'll see you later. They've done what they can here. Meyer has turned over all his material, but he has one more surprise in store. So we want to thank you for all your time and trouble. Oh, yeah. Okay, just a moment, wait. Okay. I have you something. Oh, here. What's this? Metal samples. Metal, metal samples? samples? Yeah. Where did you get these? Oh, I got it from Symbiose, and she brought them from uh, Era. Are they extraterrestrial? Yeah. Metal samples. The kind of hard evidence Stevens had hoped for. Bye-bye. We got the Vogel tape in. Great. Back in Phoenix, the investigators begin to sort out the mass of material Maya gave them. There are hundreds of photographs, the 8mm films, sound tapes of the beam ships and the fragments of metal. They know they will have to call in scientists from a variety of fields to help assess the evidence. The task appears monumental. Thanks, Tom. Tom, what about you? Yeah, I'll have one too. Okay. They decide to check the photos first. If these are fake, the rest doesn't matter. Here we have our image. The ground is below. We'll place this on the platen, emulsion side up, in order to focus on the emulsion. The first step involves translating the photographic image into digital information the language computers can read. We can start this machine from the point which it is at now and scan 500 lines, 500 points per line, at a very small aperture. And watch the result of this scan being placed, digital information, keep in mind, onto a display. All right, over here on our display, we can observe what the densitometer is doing. This microdensitometer is the same one used to help analyze the photos beamed back from space by the U.S. Pioneer mission. And tell it that we want to go five microns between each pixel. It will be digitizing a half centimeter square, scanning the first lines. The digital information will be sent on for an analysis that will take weeks to complete. Meanwhile, Welch and the elders decide to learn what they can of the history of UFO experiences. But uh, can you give us some more background on this phenomenon? What is this all about? Well, it's not a new thing, Lee. This thing's been going on for a long time. How many sightings have there been? One of the researchers calculated that uh, there may be as many as 70,000 reports in a year, worldwide. Is there anything these sightings have in common? Okay, there are some common things, uh, commonly reported. First of all, they're always accidental. UFO pictures, up to this point at least, are accidental. They happen once and they're gone. Is there anywhere that they show up more than other areas? Here's some stuff here that, that began way back. These are, these are documented cases. Some of these are even classics. Photographs. Here's one from Argentina. But this whole thing is full of them. This one is full of them. That's full of them. All of those are full of such cases. In Stevens' files are over 3,500 photographs of UFOs, some from early in this century. Most were single sightings, some observed by several people at the same time. In Perry, Ohio, the whole town watched a UFO at twilight for 30 minutes. In Brazil, a Navy photographer took a series of photos of a UFO flying over his vessel. Observers at NASA have spotted UFOs at our space launches. 
Tientsin, China, Woonsocket, Rhode Island, Norway, Corsica, Japan, New Jersey. These are among the sightings that are reported. No one can guess how many go unreported. Now they're pretty much all over the world. I don't think you could pick out a single place and say that there are more UFO sightings there than any other place. They're, it's a worldwide phenomena, and primitives as well as advanced societies all view them and they see the same things. What's the public's reaction been to all of this? Well, there was a poll made about three years ago, I think, where they asked the question, I think the question was, how many people believe that UFOs exist? And this has been a progressive thing. It's been growing. And the last one showed something like 65% of the American population believes that a UFOs exist. Why don't they contact our national leaders and land someplace like on the White House lawn? I'm not sure that national leaders haven't been contacted. Uh, there is some indication that uh, various world leaders, even church leaders, have been contacted. Mary, do you have that uh, file that we had on spectrographic analysis that we did? Oh, yeah, Tom. It's As right. the investigation continues, results from the testing begin to come in to the intercept office in Phoenix. Hey, Lee. Hey, Tom. What's up? Just got this back. We sent this photograph over to Neil Davies. Just got his report. Neil back. Davis. Physicist, aerospace industry subcontractor. Right, okay. Examined the photograph with microdensitometer. Also, these you're seeing here are the black and white color separations that he did. And let's see what the results were here. Hmm. Examination of these plots did not reveal any details which would cast doubt upon the authenticity of the photograph. Hmm. And there's more. Color copy names, color separation. Nothing was found to indicate a hoax. And his conclusion is even more interesting. Let's see. Black specs. Nothing was found in the examination of this print which could cause me to believe that the object in the photo is anything other than a large object photographed a distance from the camera. Meyer reported six different configurations of Pleiadian beam ships. Davis analyzed what the investigators designated as Variation 2. Variation 3 now goes to computer analyst Jim Dilatoso. This is the new picture that we digitized last week using the microdensitometer. We transferred it over to floppy disk here. Let's look at the first map in low-pass filtering. Why these particular colors on the screen? What are we seeing? I mapped it in such a way that the real colors uh, are not what we're seeing, but one shade of a color that's really similar to another one, uh, like two shades of red, are in high contrast so that we can really see the difference. I see. Have you found any anomalies yet of any kind? Anything I find that... strange things, but nothing that would tell me that someone's tampered with the pictures. I see. Nothing in indicating a hoax method or indicating superimposition or anything like that? Nothing that I can find. Have you been working on the grain at all yet? Yeah, yeah I have. What we're seeing here is that the film grain holds up the way that it should. In the pixel distortion test, it appears to me and to the computer that this object was photographed in the same original piece of film in, at the same time that the background was photographed. In other words, no overlay. Mm -hmm. I would say these pictures are genuine. Extrapolating from Meyer's accounts, Dilatoso programs the computer to duplicate the lights Meyer observed on the craft. At the moment, he has no explanation for their apparent rotation. Mary, any calls? Yes, yeah, Steve called. He's at home, and you're to call CRQ. CRQ. Okay. Uh, call Steve. Tell him I'll get back to him in about an hour. I'll take care of this now. Okay. Hey, Lee, look what I got here. Stevens has more news. We got a report back from Shellman. Mm -hmm. Sound analysis? He had sent the sound tapes Meyer took of the craft to Robin Shellman, specialist well, in sound he identification. Found some things. He found some things we didn't hear on there. Such as? Well, he picked up. Besides the basic sound, he picked up a small dog barking. Of course, we could hear him. He picked up a European police siren. We never heard that. He picked up a crow cawing. How the other... Wait a minute. How in the hell does he pick all this stuff up? How does he determine the sound? They've got a sound bank. 
back there that they match sounds in. They can identify known sounds. Okay, on this sound bank of uh, his, anything there to match it? Do we have he said, he, said he can't match the basic sound. He can match all of the other sounds on the tape, but he can't match the sound of the, of the object itself, the emitted sound. Now look at this. He's concluded up to this point that the machine was built, must have been built for a specialized application. Recognizing the sounds from such a machine may be difficult. Also, Later, Shellman will theorize from the sounds what those specialized applications might be. Next, Stevens takes the metal fragments to be examined under the electronic spectrometer to determine their components. Preliminary examination of the metal has been done in Switzerland. And we've got these little marker bars here that we can line up on each peak as they come up. This one indicates we have silver there. Mm -hmm. uh, over here, let's see. We've got some copper, small amount of copper. And that's like about all that's in here at the moment. The big band here is silver, though. The big one is silver. Later analysis of other fragments also reveals small amounts of tulium, a rare earth element that is difficult and costly to extract here. This is one of the... Because of the unusual nature of the findings, the fragments are given to chemist Marcel Vogel, an expert in crystalline structures and inventor of many substances used in computer components. The first specimen I looked at is a metal specimen which I classified as F1. This is the appearance that it looked at, rather golden colored on one side, silvery colored here. We find that in truth it is silver and a small amount of copper. We look at it here, this same area here under polarized light what is unusual of this small specimen is both highly crystalline nature and suddenly we come to a metal section as we see here and it showed a combination of metals that I've not encountered in any normal bit of metallurgy, both crystalline deposits and metal. Now, we, with any technology that I know of, could not achieve this on this earth plane. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself as a scientist. It's also a challenge because I showed it to one of my friends who was a metallurgist and he shook his head. He said, I don't see how it can be put together. And we find that in this area there is evidence of machining, that there are striations which look like the sample has been worked mechanically. It doesn't look like anything that we've made here. At this moment I would feel very much inclined to accept what was given to me as being true. Always security conscious, the investigators hold key discussions outdoors to prevent eavesdropping. As the work piles up, they meet to assess progress and problems. And that is, we've got a company back here and an intercept clientele, a pretty heavy clientele, what are they going to be thinking about these hard-nosed investigators running around chasing flying saucers? Tom, it's an investigation, and it's a good investigation. No matter whether you're doing a murder one investigation or industrial espionage, you still have the basic criteria that you follow, investigative procedures. And I think if we maintain those type of procedures, I think we can well, control the situation. There's one thing that we haven't thought about Eventually, Sorry. somebody is going to come to us and say, have you ever tested these people? Have you ever tried to find out if they're lying? Have you used psychological stress evaluation? Have you used lie detection? Yeah. Will Billy go for that? Oh, sure. I think Billy will go for it. He's been open with us all, all the way through. I don't think he'll stop at this point. Well, Steve, we've got another problem. We've put a lot of time and effort into this case already. We don't know when it's going to terminate. Well, I want you along. I want to do a real investigation on this, and I want real investigators. Well, what do you guys think? I think we should go for it. Okay, let's hope he's for real. Look, physicists say they're all hoaxes. I've been at this for 20 years. If this is a hoax, there are no real cases. The decision made, the team presses on. 
Computer analyst Jim Delatoso has some new findings to show Welsh. Let's go back and look at this picture again and get some information about the edges. I've discovered this interesting program for measuring the edges of things and comparing it to all the other edges in the pictures. Based on the relationship of those edges? The width of the edges and the properties in the edges. So we're stretching the data in the edges so we can count how many pixels wide it is. And it's very interesting what happens when you stretch them out because it becomes very clear. Pixels, these little squares, like building blocks, and pretty easy to count. Six, seven. So this one ranges from five to seven pixels wide, mm -hmm. this edge. So we have our range here is from six to eight. Mm -hmm. Now what this tells us in looking at all of the edges on the object is first of all that it's not a flat piece of plywood hung in the air or it's not a paste up that was done it actually has shape to it mm -hmm. and in this case a very wide range mm -hmm. which has to do with focus some of the object is more in focus than other parts of the object which tells me right off at that point that we're dealing with something of size to it. With all the data they have amassed, the investigators have also come up with a lot of new questions. While they debate the necessity for another trip to Switzerland, a sudden crisis jolts them into a decision. There has been a phone call from Meyer. Halfway between Phoenix, where the intercept officers are located, and Tucson, where Stevens lives, a spire of rock rises out of the desert floor. Part of the rim of a long extinct volcano, Picacho Peak is noted locally as the site where the last battle of the Civil War was fought. It is here that Lee Elders and Stevens meet, when necessary, again, far from curious ears. This time, Elders brings a disturbing message, one that will add a new urgency to their work. Hey, Lee, what's hey, up? Hey, Steve, how are you? Good. What's going on? Oh, God, we've got some problems. Problems? Yeah, I just talked to Billy today, and uh, someone tried to kidnap his daughter. What? Nina? Nina, right. God. Billy got there in time. He, it was two men. They were in a car. They used a knife. They tried to force her into the car. What about Nina? Is she all right? She's fine. No problems. He, uh, he fired at one of them, and they Did escaped. Uh, no, no, they haven't identified any of them yet. The police are working on it, as I understand it. This happens to people. We've had it happen before. Other cases. We're going to set up some security measures over there get a trail on these people. And I agree. We got to do something to take the energy out of this. Yeah, we, we do. Go. We're going to go back. You want to go? When can we go? Very soon. Hey, Amigo, any uh, phantoms up there? Clean up here, but I want to check for a third wire. In Switzerland, the investigators start their security no, sweep with no the phones. No infinities. Everything looks all right. I tell you what, we better run a TDR up the hill, though. See if anything's hanging on the line. What do you think about, uh, well, what can we do with the people? We've got to do something. There's two things we've got to do with them. One is we've got to get them to change the patterns, primarily Billy. Change their movements, change their patterns. Second thing we've got to do is we'll have to indoctrinate them on security. Probably set up a night watch situation of some kind. They have enough weapons here where they carry weapon, oh, yeah. flashlight, walkie-talkie? Carry the whole thing. Patrol the grounds at night. New additions to the farmyard since their last visit include a pair of peacocks whose raucous squawks make them as effective guards as the farm geese. There are new photos, too, and more film. In some, the beamship hovers by a tree. Maya says they use trees as a kind of magnetic ground. Two or more ships in the same shot are almost unheard of in UFO photos. Maya has dozens of such pictures. Ships below a horizon line, such as a hill, are even rarer. 
In this photo, a Variation 2 ship controls a smaller unmanned drone ship, designated as Variation 5. In one demonstration, a Variation 3 ship exhibits a behavior Stevens has seen before. We have often reported a nipping flight. We also have a wobbling flight, where it wobbles around a vertical axis. The bobbing effect, Meyer explains, is due to the ship riding the waves of the Earth's magnetic field, much as a boat on the ocean. When Meyer is about to have a contact, he receives a cooling sensation on his forehead. The communication is telepathic. He prepares carefully. He is usually taken aboard the beam ships, but is unable to describe their interiors very well. There are no words, he says. Apparently, they are totally unfamiliar. The gun is a precaution, due to the threats on his life. The hat is a favorite, one he picked up on his travels in the Middle East. The tattoo he received during a brief stint as a sailor. He dresses well because he can be gone for hours and the weather in these mountains changes constantly. The walkie-talkie is a necessity because he is often left far from where he parked the bike and must call to be picked up. Meyer feels the Pleiadians can communicate with him because his vibrations, the natural frequencies of his mind, are compatible with theirs. Each human on Earth and each human over the whole universe has uh, different vibrations. The vibrations of human is made out of his thinking and the vibration themselves, they are something like magnetic electrical waves and they are turning from human to human, from planet to planet and over the whole space of the universe. When entering your terrestrial state, we must make an adjustment in our vibrational patterns. It is similar to your adjusting the fine-tuning on your communications devices. In our case, it allows for the clear perception necessary for an exchange to take place. You see, this around this area where I took several rolls of films. Mm -hmm. um, this picture here, yeah, I took this. over there. Uh -huh. What size uh, is that ship, Billy? They told me it's seven meters. One of the most frequent spots for the contacts is Obersadeleg, a wide valley just ten minutes from the farm at Schmidruti. Here, Meyer took one of his most spectacular series of photographs. Between both roads. And you can see here these lighty trees here. Mm -hmm. That's there up. And here on the left side, this hill. What's happened there behind? Yeah. And the trees here down, it's that one there. Yeah. Okay, then is this for this coming? Uh, this picture I took there, if you go left side a little bit, here, if you go down, like this way here. The beam ship stayed in the area for almost 20 minutes, flying slowly, often skimming the treetops, sometimes just hovering in place. And the ship was a little behind them when I took this picture and just now the trees are growing up in the last months they are about one and a half or two meter higher mm -hmm. than at the time when I took this picture and then where did it move? it uh, left that place yeah. to the left side something like this. yeah like this and then it was moving over there you see here the small tree where it's happened there. This one, that's that there. 
Did it come across in front of the trees like this? Yes, yes. And you can see there behind left side of this one, this mm -hmm. tree, the higher one there. Yeah. And after this picture, I got the other one uh -huh. to that position there. For the rover? Yeah. I mean, I think we got another one in here now. It's yeah. The one in between but there, right? I had to go back a little bit mm -hmm. there down, and oh. from there I took the picture. That's the tree mm -hmm. there down, yes. what you can see. The investigators are impressed by the vastness of the valley, the steep drops and the obvious difficulty of hanging models from anywhere to fake the pictures. The stunning clarity of the pictures and the accessibility of the site gives the investigators the chance to put the photos through another test. Billy, this, uh, we're using this to measure distance. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the latest in infrared measuring devices. Yes. It's actually a small computer. It's made by Wild Herbrook here in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to do here, Lee is up there with the reflector. Yep. And what this will do is send infrared light out mm -hmm. and reflect out of that reflector back here. And this will rapidly tell us the distance and will also tell us how much higher or lower he is. That's about where he is standing, right there. Mm -hmm. That's right, please. Yes. Okay, we'll go to on systems. Yes, we've got. 1,262 feet, 0.85. The precise measurements and photos are fed into the computer. The edges of known objects, such as the trees and the hills, are translated into pixels. Since these measurements are known, the number of pixels in the edge of the unknown object, the craft, gives its distance. The beam ship is determined to be just where Maya said it was. Simple triangulation then gives it size. Seven meters, or about 21 feet in diameter. Really, how many By now, the investigators have made over a dozen trips to Switzerland. The case takes up more and more of their time and taxes their ingenuity. Each test leads to another, and every result is double and triple checked. To test the possibility that the Maya photographs were made using small-scale models suspended by transparent monofilament, the investigators bring with them a detailed model of a beam ship they identify as Variation 2. While Welsh flies the model on a hilltop above the farmhouse, Maya and Stephen snap several rolls of film. The camera Maya is using is the same one with which he took all the other pictures. The results are impressive. To the naked eye, some of the photos appear genuine. Those photographs, they're interesting. They look yeah. pretty good. Pretty you know, good. I saw one difference in them, and that was that those models look white. They don't reflect that silver gleam like the pictures of Billy had. You want to look at the focus in them? Hey, hey. Hi, guys. What's uh, hey, talking about? Right. <clears throat> the pictures. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Some of them looked pretty bad, but uh, some of them look pretty good. I think we ought to test them. Pictures of the model are not all that good. If you, in the pictures where he focused on the model, the horizon is out of focus. Where he focused on the horizon, the model is out. Well, not all of them, Steve. I mean, some of these are very, very good. We should put them in there for comparative testing under computer analysis. Uh, we've got to have that comparison. Frankly, this could be a scam. So when we look at models, there's a variety of things that are different than when we look at photographs of these objects load in some colors first. That object right there is solid. It's one solid color. There's very little contour in it compared to other objects that are in the photograph, like the trees and things that we have color mapped in the background to be high contrast colors. Mm -hmm. And I've blown them up so we can look at the edges as pixels. So we're going from the brown object to the horizon. It takes two pixels. I mean, you can count it with your finger. You don't even need a computer. Why is that important? What does it mean? There's no contour to the object. Mm -hmm. Remember when we looked at the other photographs uh, that were taken by Meyer, the width of the edges ranged from four to nine. Mm -hmm. Point of the story. This is a small model. It's easy to tell small models. Well, we tested that fighter sequence, and that came out pretty good. Um, 
We didn't find any strings in there. And when we got through blowing it up in the computer, we had the outline of the Mirage fighter, everything. The incident occurred at Schmabuld. Meyer claims the jet made 22 passes at the beam ship. Computer analysis using the information from a known object, the Mirage fighter, shows again that the beam ship is the size and distance Meyer claims. What did you find out from the base? You, you had some investigation well, we're, going we're in that pretty area. pretty tight here on military security, but uh, they won't let us talk to the pilot. We did find somebody who claimed that he found a mechanic who worked in that squadron at that time, and there was an exercise going on, and an airplane did come back with the electrical system melted out. The fire control system had to change a lot of black boxes, get it operational again. What about Meyer? What are we going to do with him? I think we ought to put it to him, you know. Let's go for the man, find out uh, if he's telling the truth, and put the full court press on it. How do they contact you, Billy? How do you know to go out and meet him? Yeah, that's a simple way. If I hear the order in my head to go to a contact, then I leave the house or just the place where I stay at the moment and then they will guide me to the place where they pick up me. Well, let me ask a question. Why you? You see, um, I can work together with them because uh, I understand to close up my earth body vibrations. See, they, Billy's explained to me before that they perceive in Earth humanity all the vibrations of lust, envy, greed, avarice, all of the things that make us dense, and it gives us a heavy vibration that they react to as a bad smell. In fact, he's even mentioned that it's, they call it the auric stench of Earth humanity, and it's discomforting to them. It gives them problems, it makes them sick. Yeah. To stay in their when he long. closes up his vibrations, are we talking about an altered state of some sort, like uh, alpha, beta, or theta, as far as the consciousness? No, he, is it a in a way, in a way, it's like meditation. He he rids himself of all of the unpleasant aspects of Earth life. But Billy, the vibration of uh, of the Earth human. You say they're advanced technologically. How how far ahead of us? advanced are they? They are about 3,500 years in their experiences about technology uh, far out from our level. And they study us because we represent an earlier stage of their own evolution. Yeah. You know, they had a uh, war, they had trouble together, they was fighting together, and they needed a very, very long time to get peace under themselves. They made a very interesting observation at one point. They said that if we could now concentrate Earth's energies and resources, we could achieve all that they can do now in about 300 years mm -hmm. of our time. Yeah. Is there? If you've been in the ship, why not photographs inside of the Pleiadians themselves? It's, it's impossible to make it because there uh, are powers inside they always break the film. He's taken a number of rolls of film and when they're developed they're usually black. If they've got anything it's wavy lines through. So, you're so I, 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 I uh, lose it so hundreds of films. Why are they here now and what do they want? You see they don't come here to harm us. They don't come to start uh, trouble here or war or to overtake the earth in their ruling. They just see us here as their little brothers or something like that. And they want to bring the real teaching of the natural life and of the spiritual belonging, spiritual teaching, spiritual life, and all this. But they must want something from us. They just want nothing. Nothing. You see, for the human on earth, it's uh, impossible to believe this, but that's really the truth. They just want nothing from the humans on earth. 
The session goes on for hours. To every question, Maya has an answer. The investigators are unable to shake him or to find flaws in his story. In Phoenix, Dilettoso comes up with a startling new discovery. We're getting into a really interesting area in these pictures. We don't really have to test every picture anymore to see if it's a real picture or not. We can't find anything that tells us it's a hoax, so let's start looking for things that are interesting from picture to picture. Look at the buller here. It seems to contour to the shape of the craft. Have you seen this in a lot of the other photographs? In the Meyer case. Look at the bottom here on what's down here. It stops right in the horizon. With the coincidence of it follows this line in the craft, and it follows that line in the craft, and it follows parallel right underneath the bottom there, and we find it in half of the other pictures, I think it means something. You think it's something that we're not seeing in the photograph with our eyes? We get some kind of an aura, whether it's infrared, thermal energy, as yet I don't know. I think that craft is putting out a force field. The team had shown the Maya material to a variety of experts in an attempt to learn if any of it could be duplicated. They estimated it would require expertise in at least a dozen different fields, including metallurgy, astronomy, ancient history, and psychology. The panel concluded it would take over 10,000 man hours and cost in excess of $1 million to duplicate the evidence Maya has. At that, the computer could still spot any fabrication. When we bought this center here, it was a picture like at the World War second end and when we bought it nobody of us had any money we was working practically day and night for several years many times 22 23 hours a day and so we built it up uh, everything here up on the land and so it grows slowly but it's all real, our handwork. This is a psychological stress evaluation test, better known as PSE. Mm -hmm. What we're going to do is ask you some questions. You will answer yes or no. We will tape these questions. Mm -hmm. The tape will go back to the United States. At that time, we'll test it through a computer to measure your micro tremors in your voice. Mm -hmm. It's like a lie detector test. Yeah. yeah. Would you agree okay, to doing this? Okay, start it. Okay, first question. Is your name Edward Meyer? Mm -hmm. Yes. Could you speak a little louder, please? Are you wearing a shirt? Yes. Do you live in Switzerland? Yes. Have you taken photographs of Palladian spacecraft? Yes. Do you ride your moped? Yes. Do you receive your mail at Schmidrudy? Yes. Did you fake the photographs taken at Ober Satellite with a model suspended? No. Wait till the answer. Or wait till the question is finished. Suspended by a string? No. Let's do that one more time, okay? Wait till I finish. Do you live in Switzerland? Yes. The tape is taken back to be analyzed by Bob Phelan, a former criminal investigator with the Sheriff's Department of Colorado and a specialist in lie detection was also a yes answer. Number three, do you live in Switzerland? Uh, yes, he lives in Switzerland. Uh, there's enough stress here to indicate that uh, probably isn't where he prefers to live or he's lived someplace else. Okay, question four was the first relevant question you asked him, is have you taken the photographs of spaceships, spacecraft? His answer was yes. He's being extremely forceful, though not deceptive. Mm -hmm. 
And my opinion on that particular question is that he's being as truthful as possible. Mm -hmm. Number seven was the second relevant question you asked him. And he answered right on top of the question. And the person asking the question had asked him to answer the question again. And then he asked the question again. The stress levels between the two diminished the second time that the question was asked, which is uh, not indicative of deception, because stress builds in a deceptive pattern. Doesn't, it doesn't diminish. Mm -hmm. If it was a deceptive answer, the stress would then increase, not decrease. Mm -hmm. Now, something was extremely interesting to me was the uh, eighth question you asked him on, uh, do you drink coffee? And for some reason, he's more stressful on the, on the statement about coffee than he is about the picture of the spacecraft. Yeah, that makes sense. Because about three days before we tested Meyer, he promised his wife he'd stop drinking coffee, but we noticed he was sneaking a few occasionally. Okay, that could probably be the account for it then. Phelan reviews the tape several times. He could find no evidence of deception in the statements about Meyer's experiences. Much of Meyer's film has been lost or stolen, but the remaining sequences are, as promised, the most astonishing ever released. In one demonstration, the beam ship flies around a tree which can be seen to sway in the backwash. Once again, in slow motion. even slower. Later, Semyasi brings a new beam ship to pose for Maya's cameras. The variation quite unlike anything he has seen before. She explains, as best he can understand it, the function of the spheres for propulsion of the craft in interstellar travel. The sound of the new beam ship shows marked differences to the sounds of the other variation craft. Maya tapes these as well. The tapes are taken to electronics consultant Niels Rognerud and sound engineer Steve Ambrose for examination. Um, we have two pieces of equipment. Uh, one measures the signal we're listening to in the time domain, the top one here. And the bottom one is measuring the frequency components of the signal. What does this mean when they're all together like that? What you have is you have many uh, tones happening at the same time. Mm -hmm. And right now, they're aligned. Now they're disaligning. They're out of alignment. They're very much out of alignment. Now they're starting to centralize on one. It's not as though maybe before you had 10 different frequencies at random and then all of a sudden nine dropped out and you only had one left what's happening is the ten different con frequencies are converging on one central frequency which is i find very interesting this is probably one of the most interesting things about the tape is that there are what's this right now very very many tones yeah and mm -hmm. they're all changing very fast for a moment there we were looking in and we had three evenly spaced frequencies see it there again, yeah, you got them again. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, would it be possible to recreate this sound? Uh, to be honest with you, I personally don't think so. There are not uh, synthesizers on the market that have oscillators that change that randomly. Uh -huh. Even if you got nine or ten of them going, they wouldn't change 
from those peaks that quickly. Um, so a significant thing is this rate of change. Well, and besides, if you were going to create a, a noise for a spaceship, it, you'd be hard put to come up with something as original as this. There's, there's another alignment there. Mm-hmm. Okay, Lee, what we can do here is... Intrigued by the findings, Lee Elders takes the tape to Robin Shellman, who has studied the sounds of the earlier craft. We're showing this uh, throbbing, modulating uh, beat that we hear on the tape. This beat, or modulation, occurs at these frequency peaks. Each one of these peaks is a discrete frequency. If you wanted to give a, uh, a visual display, let's say we're talking a motor. Could be a motor, a shaft of a motor, with four magnetic poles or coils around this uh, shaft. The curious thing about this, it changes from four to five, six, seven, all the way up to a number that uh, is difficult to discern. At a certain point, you're going to generate a certain amount of magnetism. And then later on, you want a stronger field, well, you're going to select um, eight, eight fields. All right, now you're going to hear eight pulses on the tape. And then later on, you want a stronger field, uh, you can select uh, 16, 32. Uh... Is there anything unusual about this? I would think it's highly unusual. I don't really see any application for it, uh, with the exception of like I say, either generating a magnetic wave of some sort for laboratory purposes or uh, maybe in this case, uh, propulsion. Without ever having seen a picture of the new beam ship, Shellman has drawn a representation of the spheres and offered an explanation of their function. The tapes hold still another surprise. Also, another interesting point to note here is we have a steady, it seems to be a steady pattern all throughout all of this random mm -hmm. signal. Uh, it seems to be a level change very steadily in around five to ten cycles per second, which happens to be uh, in the area of the natural magnetic resonance of Earth, uh, also called the Schumann resonance. Is that significant in any way? It could be. Uh, it's just interesting to note the correlation there. The, the peculiar correlation is yeah, something strange. I mean, why, why would yeah. the correlation be there? Yeah. You can see it on the oscilloscope. Mm -hmm. Meyer says the beam ships can ride the magnetic field of the Earth. Rognerud's findings seem to bear this out. Going back to computer models of previous beam ships, simulation of the revolving lights reveals a kind of pulsing that matches the varying frequencies. Analyst Jim Dilatoso is convinced that the sound and light frequencies are related. The phenomena might also explain the ability of the beam ships to suddenly disappear from sight and just to suddenly reappear. In this eight millimeter film, the beam ship at the top of the frame disappears and appears again almost simultaneously, just above the slope of the hill. When it's examined, the beam ship disappears and appears in the same frame, which means that less than one eighteenth of a second has elapsed. In order to complete their background research, the elders visit Scotland to talk with John McVeigh, a member of the Royal Society of Astronomers, and a published authority on the structure of the universe and the possibility of interstellar travel. Is it possible to travel from the Pleiades to this planet? I think the only way I, any intelligent beings and living beings could possibly reach here the inference of the sun from the uh, Pleiades uh, would be by some unconventional means probably by hyperspace. One can use this term now a bit more freely because uh, it has kind of scientific um, mm -hmm. significance now. Mm -hmm. You know, this McVeigh is quite an impressive guy. He's written six books on related subject matter, life in outer space, interstellar travel. I think uh, he knows uh, quite a bit of what he's talking about. Myself. 
Yeah, I've got one question I'd like to ask him, though. What's that? I want to see if he's got any information on this historical connection we keep coming up with. Mm -hmm. Because we found it everywhere from the Incas to the Aztecs to the Greeks to the Romans to <laughs> Egypt, everywhere. Possibly he's come across something in his research. Well, the Pleiades are very well known. In fact, they're a very ancient group. They're, they're mentioned, in fact, in the Bible, in the book of Job. I can't just give you chapter and verse, but they are, they are a very old uh, group. And they've been used by many ancient civilizations to signify the approach of, of autumn, winter. Hippocrates recorded that summer begins with their rising and winter with their setting. And Greek temples are aligned to these events. The great pyramids of Egypt are also aligned to the Pleiades. To some African nations, they are known as the Seven Goddesses. In China, they are called the Seven Maidens, and they are the seven beneficent spirits of the Hindu Vedas. Curiously, in all these separate cultures, they are always referred to in the female. The Pleiadians told Maya they used females for their first contacts because they appeared less aggressive to early man. The Mayans celebrated the moment when the Pleiades reached their zenith as the most important event in their calendar. Pre-Incan peoples believed their gods came down from the Pleiades. And on the mysterious plains of Nazca, Peru, the Thunderbird marks the plaza of the Pleiades. In other cultures, the cluster is regarded as the place of God's house, the center of heaven. The law of American Indian tribes is full of the Pleiades, which, according to some, stand at the gates of heaven. Historian John M. Hula, a Kiowa Indian, relates one story that survives to this day. It is tied to Devil's Tower in Wyoming. This mountain here, Kiowas lived in this area, and we call it the Old Tai, Old Tai. Kiowas camped through here, winter camp. And these children were playing. They were playing and they were running along this ledge over here. A giant bear came out of the woods and chased these children. The seven children, seven, seven sisters, we call them. And they came to this one ledge here. And the children got on top of it. This ledge began to grow. It grew out of the ground. As the mountain grew, the bear's claws were scratched in the mountain. And that's what we see today is the grooves up there. And from there, the seven sisters went on up into the sky. And they're up there today. The Pleiadians today, they wasn't created and born on the Pleiadian planets. They came out of the planets of the system Lyra and Vega. But two, they was not created there because their forebears came from some other planets and other uh, galaxy somewhere into space. Those space travelers who were the ancestors of Earth races came from star systems differing from yours in many respects. When these ancestors came to your planet too, there were already humans developing here. Since in the universe there exist many different colored peoples, races developed here that were able to adapt to the conditions in different parts of Earth. We can see also we not are the baddest races in the universe. How many sects go to tell and to say that the most bad thing what's happened over all the universe shall be the human being on earth. It isn't true. There is trouble here and there is trouble somewhere else into the space on other planets too. There remain only a few questions to clear up, but one of them has perhaps the most bearing on the Maya case. 
If his story is true, how did those beings accomplish a journey of such staggering distances? The, uh, the investigators put the question to Alan Holt, an astrophysicist who works with the US space program, and David Froning, a specialist in spacecraft design for that program. Gentlemen, is faster than light travel possible today in our technology, or is this still just theory? There have been physicists that are, have been so bold and brave as to actually postulate the existence of particles that travel faster than the speed of light. And they have called these entities tachyons. And they have shown that uh, the existence of such faster than light entities may not violate uh, known laws of physics. I've worked on a kind of a field theory approach, uh, which is basically uh, uh, an extension, I like, we like to view it as an extension of Einstein's uh, last work on a unified field theory. I, I really think that everything is pointing to a breakthrough uh, that will make possible faster than light travel. Now, not, not all physicists will agree with that. How would it work? Well, I've represented uh, here uh, hyperspace currents by these blue and, and red lines. Down in here would be space and time. So space and time is what we're aware of and what we're what we deal with in everyday life. But there could exist a higher dimensional space, a hyperspace, that we can interact with uh, by certain configurations of electromagnetic energy patterns. So the, the concept here would be you start out with a certain pattern. Uh, generally, you're tied in with the Earth's gravitational field and its hyperspace currents, but there's a, pos a low uh, connection with perhaps a, a distant star. As you change the pattern, the connection with the Earth's gravitational field and its hyperspace currents decreases, and the connection with the distant star's pattern increases. And so, in effect, you're being pushed away from the Earth's gravitational field and pulled in to a gravitational field of a distant star. I had some artists uh, do some work here showing a spacecraft leaving our solar system and going out of space and time. This red line represents the division between space and time and hyperspace. And the spacecraft, uh, based on the propulsion concept I proposed, uh, would use a field resonance effect to effectively jump into hyperspace, disappearing from space and time in our solar system, and then reappearing at a, at a distant star. Mr. Froding, you showed me a diagram that you had worked up that's very similar to this, that uh, describes a uh, hyperspace leap in some fashion also. It's remarkable how similar they are. Well, what I've tried to symbolize by this diagram is, first of all, the familiar space-time plane of existence shown here in blue of our physical world. At the journey's start, some distance is traveled and some time taken getting out of the solar system as shown by the curved line at the left. Then a hyperspace jump covers most of the distance with almost no lapse of time. Some time is taken again decelerating to the target, the curved line on the right. So this line here is very similar to the red line Alan has on his chart. That's, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. This, this line he shows here is the jump I show here. <laughs> yeah. What shape would such ships have to be to make such a trip? I initially came up with, with this design, with a central uh, uh, circular uh, symmetrical shape. This top uh, figure shows the uh, field resonance system in its, uh, its uh, space-time jump mode where it initially rises up to a certain point, and as it rises up, as the pattern gets closer to the resonance point, uh, the colors uh, can change, showing the higher energy uh, flow. And uh, you do get an effect uh, in this concept that is very similar to what is observed in, in some uh, UFO sightings. Okay. Dave, uh, concerning the Pleiades, they're about 500 light years away from our planet. What would you estimate the time in this form of travel? So we're talking about uh, on the order of eight, eight hour transit times between the wow. the Earth and the, and the system such as the Pleiades star cluster. Mm -hmm. wow. According to Maya, the Pleiadians make the trip in something over seven hours. Maya also says that the Pleiadian beam ship's use of the magnetic field of the Earth is something our scientists are close to being able to accomplish as well.
Using this information, the computer is able to project from one series of Maya photographs the flight path of the beam ships in the Earth's magnetic field. While the contacts continue, life on the farm proceeds at an even more hectic pace. To help free Maya, volunteers take on a lot of the routine work. But their very presence, their questions, even their enthusiasm create as much strain as they relieve. The last 20 or 30 years, there was uh, many people who have seen UFOs. There are many people around the world who like uh, sensation only. Um, other one who are doing hoax to get money maybe, to get a name. But there are really many contacts and many people who have uh, seen UFOs. Between his work for the Pleiadians and the demand for his attention on the farm, Maya finds little respite. For moments of precious solitude, he retreats to the land he knows. Above everything stands one force alone. We call it the creation. It regulates the laws overall, the life and death of everything in the universe, because it is everything in the universe. Real spirituality comes from the understanding of the laws of nature, the natural working of cause and effect, each contributing to and sharing with all. When you indulge in ritual and ceremony, real spirit pines away until it is gone. A spiritually developed being acknowledges creation in all things, from the largest to the smallest. Following this way, Fears and doubts vanish like rain before the sun. The story is by now a sensation in the European press. Every major magazine features Meyer and his photos. Television coverage from as far away as Japan spreads the message to a public hungry for even more information. The quiet farm is suddenly a mecca. Inundated with visitors eager to meet Maya, see the photos, hear his experiences firsthand. Agapula, Tome Exo. Ottimo in Exo, Milaime of this. But Maya cannot refuse anyone. It is the promise he made to Samyasi. <laughs> You have whole organizations which investigate our beam ships, but they have little material which is really authentic. However, the authorities already know much about our existence. But they continue to deny the fact of our existence, or even the fact of their research. They want only to rule the cosmos. But they are not even able to create on Earth peace among themselves. Many of those who come seek answers, assurance, even the promise that someone or something will save us. If we want peace and knowledge and law and everything here on earth, we have to change everything by ourselves as human beings from this earth. Despite a severe language barrier on both sides, Brit Elders has grown close to the Maya children. Yes. And Gilgamesh a Maya. Yes. Could you ask Atlantis for me if he's had any discussions with his friends in school mm -hmm. about what has happened with the experiences? Mm. Mama. Yeah. And sometimes. They said always it's it's not true what he said. 
Aha. And Methuselah, has he talked to any of his friends? Und du hast du mit deinen Mitschülern geredet? Oh, ja. Und was haben sie gesagt? Wir haben immer gesagt, Ufo Meier. He said they make jokes with him and said to him, Ufo Meier, Ufo Meier, like this. Oh. And then they, they have to go to the teacher and the teacher said to the other uh, people, why you say Ufo Meier to uh, Methuselah? And so they are quiet now. Would you ask them for me if they wish that their father had never had these experiences? Atlantis say on one side yes and the other side no. Why the one side yes? If Billy don't have seen this UFO, they, people don't come to us and not so much fun for him. Not so much fun for him. It is especially hard on the children. With the publicity, security measures have tightened up. The children are taken to and from school, and their activities around the farm restricted. Most vestiges of a normal life have disappeared. But when a threat does appear, it is not from assassins or kidnappers, but a wholly unexpected source. One night, the household is awakened by a brilliant light that bathes the whole area in an eerie glow. Maya, disturbed because he has had no telepathic indications, grabs his gun and his camera. The light changes shape and intensity. It moves out over the valley, illuminating the valley floor, rising and falling until dawn, then disappears. At his next contact, Maya asks Samyasi about the phenomenon. She has no explanation. The Pleiadians do not know what the strange lights could have been. Maya is shaken. You know, everything is going on more and more difficult. I get trouble. I get trouble here in Schmidruti. I get trouble with the government, with the people around us. I can understand you know? this, Billy. It's not unique. Anybody that has an experience runs into problems, but the experience is unique. You, you've got to keep yeah, going here. Yeah, and that's true. But, you know, there come some people here from the morning to the evening. Too many of them, all of them want to talk with me. I get trouble with them because I say no. There is some other people who likes to kill me who likes to kidnap uh, the children. I know it's got to be very hard on you, Billy, but we've got to go on. Yeah, that's to say very easy for you, now, but not for me. I put a lot of time in this. We've taken yeah. your pictures back, we've tested them, we've tested the metal, we've tested the sounds. They all test good. You've got the best evidence that we have in any case, and I've been at this for 20 years. Yeah. And. We can't stop. And what do you find out all of it? Is it not true or is it... Well, just... we're uh -huh. finding evidence that tends to support the case. It looks like it's really happening. Now, you have your own truth, and you know what's happening, but we've got to demonstrate this to ourselves. Please give it some serious thought. I need you. Yeah, that's true, but just now I don't know what I shall do, you know. I'm down. My nerves are... Flying crazy. Mm -hmm. My mind slowly, slowly is turning over. Can uh, I have to think over about it? Please give it some serious thought, Billy. We 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 can't stop now. We we don't have any other way to go. But I think the world needs to know. I think you feel the world needs to know, but you just don't want to be the one. Somebody has to be. I know, but I have to think over about it. I don't know. Just now, I don't know. At the bottom of despair, an incident occurs that will reaffirm Meyer's faith and give him the inspiration to go on. Stevens forwards a letter he received from a woman who had been seeing her daughter off at the Zurich airport. She shot several pictures, the usual departure shots, ending with a shot of the plane taking off. When it was developed, an object she had not noticed in the viewfinder of the camera had been captured on film. From the configuration, Maya recognizes it as one of the Pleiadian beamships.
alone? Now he knows he is neither insane nor alone. For myself, I don't worry. I know the people over all the world calls me sometimes foolish. But too, there is some other people who is thinking a little bit. There is other people who is thinking a much. And then I don't worry if some of them calls me foolish or mad. Then I think it's very necessary to fulfill my mission. And I don't care about my health, I don't can care about my life. If I have to lose my health or my life in fulfilling of my mission, then I have it to do. Figure out how many times we've been here between the four of us. We've been here a total of almost 20 trips. Wow. 265 days. That's collectively between all four of us. And uh, we're still searching. But I don't think there's much more we can do in the investigation end of it. I think it's pretty tight. I agree with you. I think we've reached our limit as far as an investigation is concerned. I think maybe now what we should think about doing is telling other people what we've done in the investigation and what we've found. Try to take some of the stigma off of it. I think we should talk about it and let everybody make their own decisions. Yeah. Ready to go home? Just about. Okay, wir sind heute also zusammengekommen, weil ich Bericht bekommen habe vom Lee. Vom the investigators are anxious to release their findings. Maya realizes this will expose the group at the farm to even greater pressures. He puts the issue to them, emphasizing that with wider publicity they can expect even further disruptions in their lives. But the others too feel it is time. They will do what they can. Why here? Why in this tiny, quiet, bordered country known till now for clocks and cheese? A banking center, aggressively neutral, a winter and summer resort. Nothing about Switzerland seems to indicate the choice. Except, Maya is here. Pleiadians told me if I like, I can go with them to the Pleiadian to stay there, to spend my life there. But the Earth, it's a very lovely and nice planet. And the humans here on Earth, they are not better and not better than on a other planet. My hopes and my dreams, they are very simple. To bring love and peace and the fulfilling of all the natural and creation laws over all the world. Thank you for all your help and cooperation. Don't mention about all that. Thanks for working with us. Okay. If we've given you a bad time, we apologize, but that's strictly been for the sake of the investigation. Okay. I hope you'll go on to work everything. Uh, we're we're going to look into it good. Yeah. We'll let you know. Well, we'll okay. see you later. Bye bye, Brit. Good journey. Bye you. bye, Tom. See you Good again. Flight. <laughs> so, Cheers, Billy. See you. Yeah. Bye bye. Billy, it's been a pleasure. Bye bye, we. Yeah. Uh, we just a moment. They still comes. They are working here together with us. If they don't leave so early. They will stay here for the next couple of years. So they are among us now, watching, perhaps waiting for us to join them. We are not superior beings, nor are we missionaries, but we feel duty bound to the humans of Earth to tell them the only thing limiting the progress of the Earth human 
is the Earth human himself.